faculdade de odontologia e a gente tem trabalhado bastante esse, esse conceito da questão do uso de antibiótico oral que você acabou de apresentar aqui com todos esses dados bastante relevantes agora eu queria saber se você na sua experiência pessoal se você indica o uso paralelo de probióticos quando dá necessidade do uso de antibióticos é, via oral em qualquer circunstância, que a gente sabe e você reafirmou todas essas interações. Isso na nossa prática diária de médico e também orientando os odontologistas, a gente vê que isso passa a ser relevante. A gente tem trabalhos que mostram o um aumento de porfiromonas, de prevotelas na boca e obviamente que elas descem para o trato gastrointestinal com todas as implicações que você colocou. Então a gente coloca uma restrição ao uso dos enxaguatórios orais, bem como preconiza o uso dos probióticos. Então eu gostaria de saber sua opinião a respeito desse tema. So, thank you so much. That's an excellent, excellent question. Oh, that's weird to hear that translated at the same time, sorry. Um, the, so, so, what he's asking is about, um, in, in particular, in dental practice, when you give antibiotics, um, which are frequently used for dental practice, and what my thoughts are on probiotic use and if we should give probiotics at the same time. So, I've done a lot of work on probiotics, and I In general, and I am not an MD, I, you know, and would not guide any clinical, um, you know, administration of anything. Um, but just from what I know scientifically, in general, I think probiotics never hurt. And one of the arguments for people, they say, don't give probiotics during antibiotic treatment because the antibiotics are just going to kill the probiotics. First of all, most of the probiotics are dead anyway. And we really believe that the effect of the probiotics is actually the um, bacterial products having an effect. So, so things like the um, downstream products that are, that are having an effect that could really be beneficial. So in general, I say yes. I say that giving these beneficial bacteria during the antibiotics can still have a potential benefit. And then after, and, and so this is something that really needs to be better understood, and there's a lot of work going into antibiotics and probiotics and fecal transplants right now, um, trying to better understand them. But I think after antibiotics in particular is when, you know, trying to reseed better bacterial cultures could have a potential benefit. Again, it's, you know, the probiotics are hard because we do see minor changes. There's almost never shown colonization of probiotics. You know, once you stop taking them, those bacteria tend to be gone. Kind of, and, and I think what the data indicate here too with antibiotics is that it's very difficult to really shift the microbiome community. Um, you know, it tends to revert back to what it was. So I think probiotics in general can, you know, potentially dampen this, and that would be a really interesting follow-up study is to do the antibiotics and do probiotics, you know, during or after. Um, so that was a very long-winded way to say I think probiotics in general are beneficial, but it's not going to fix the problem. Nikki, fantastic data. I think this, it's amazing how uh, we change things without knowing. I mean, giving antibiotics every day in our clinics. But I have two very stupid questions. The first one is, uh, you've shown an increase in CD4 in vaginal mucosa after giving antibiotics. My question is, could that be explained by overgrowth of fungi that could trigger uh, migration of T cells and increase target cells for HIV or SDI infections? So that is an excellent question, not a stupid question at all. We did not measure the fungi in here. We really should. Danny Durek, I'm sending you samples. Um, <laughs> but it, we really should because, because in, in several of the bacteria that actually were altered are associated with increased, how, how do I say it correctly, candida? Candida. I, I don't pronounce that word correctly, candida infection. Um, so, so that absolutely could be going on and, and it's a really, really interesting question to look at and we 100% should look at that and, and just haven't. Um, but, but that's a fantastic question. And the other question is regarding uh, paramomycin 
when you gave uh, oral. We usually don't give immunoglycosides orally to anyone except one condition. When you want to get those uh, very severe uh, liver insufficiency patients and they, they develop encephalopathy mm -hmm. and you give neomycin to mm -hmm. decrease the population of cells in the gut. So my question is, when you show the data with the distribution of, uh, of bacteria, um, how would that uh, translate to, the, to the, the number of bacteria in the gut, and are we really benefiting these patients giving uh, oral uh, non-absorbable antibiotics? In a, a follow-up, uh, should we give a combination of antibiotics instead, which would make more sense? So those are two really good questions there. So. To address the first part, you know, I mean, we're not looking at the number of bugs. We're looking at relative abundance of communities relative to each other. So it's very difficult to ascertain exactly how you're changing, how much bacteria is there. Um, and we have some data on the Q, doing qPCR to actually enumerate it from the stool, but it's, you know, reflective of the gut. It's hard to tell. And so, I mean, the short answer is I don't know. I, and, and how that affects it. And again, and, and we, we didn't include that group, again, because it's commonly done to treat people with it. We included it because we thought, you know, if we see downstream changes, maybe we won't see it, you know, it, trying to understand if it's the antibiotic that's doing the downstream changes directly or if it's changes in the bacterial communities. And I think these data do indicate that just changing those bacterial communities are having the downstream effect on immunity and not the antibiotic themselves, right? Um, but. As far as, you know, giving it and it, does it have a benefit, I think we have to look closer, but I, I would say that there probably is, and I think when going into the combination, I think we really need to understand it, and that's another thing, and again, this is done in monkeys, and I think we need to do more work in humans to understand this specifically in human disease, but in general, I, I think these data indicate that we're not changing the bacterial populations we think we're changing. Um, and, and so I think that we need to do more studies to better understand how we can combine antibiotics. And, you know, and my true passion is what I really want to do is just get better ways to target certain bacteria because that's what we're really lacking right now. You know, we're causing these huge disruptions and we may not even be targeting the bacteria we're targeting or we're trying to target. So, but all very good questions and I, I don't have great answers, but it's, I, I do think it's important lines of future research. Additional questions? I actually have a question for Nikki. So uh, it's a couple of related questions, actually. So have you found also an increase in CD4, in mucosal CD4, uh, and for rectal mucosa? No, so we, when we looked at the colon biopsies, we saw slight increases in CD4, but not the substantial increases that we saw in the vagina. We, what we saw more was it seems that the CD4 T cells that were there changed function because these TH17, TH22. Unfortunately, with the vaginal biopsies, we couldn't look at that because you don't get as many cells out of the vagina, so that's why I only had bulk populations. But so, so what we're seeing was not so much an influx of overall cells in the gut, but a change of function. I see. So do you believe, based on that, uh, that uh, antibiotics could increase the risk of HIV acquisition through rectal mucosa? So, and, you know, we didn't specifically look at the CD4 T cells in the rectal mucosa. I think we have those data that we should go back to. That's a really good question, and I, we should understand that much better. Yes, so certainly. So my, the point is, um, because we have been discussing PrEP and PrEP implementation and how often we should test and treat STIs and whether we should perhaps uh, give treatments uh, for asymptomatic patients on a regular basis, and that could be an implication for, for this kind of... No, and that, that is a really, really good question. And we're actually getting rectal biopsies from um, males pre and post PrEP initiation in Miami, and that's one of the things is a lot of times they're coming in for treatment for STIs. So we should actually include that in the analysis in these men, because you're absolutely right. If we're increasing CD4s in the rectal mucosa and you're increasing targets, and we know we're having, you know, this sort of inflammatory barrier damage, that could have huge implications for increasing HIV transmission. And, you know, do we want to do, if we're treating an STI, do you want to do a probiotic or some sort of dual, you know, therapy or, you know, really warn people during antibiotic treatments, you know, not to have sex as much because you're at higher risk. And it, it's a fantastic question and I think has huge implications and just 
I can't specifically answer it with these data right now. Thank you. Michael. No? Thank you so much.